Ephesians chapter 4, you'll get, we'll get there in just a little bit. It is an honor to be here when Pastor asked me. He kind of put a little pressure on me yesterday. He's like, if you're right with God, you'll say yes. And, um, you know, not being a pastor, I've always been taught you listen to your pastor. So I'm thinking that that was a little bit of uh, leverage he had on me. But uh, it's been a huge blessing to have been here, kind of been here a couple times for chapel, been slipped into a couple services on, on the way, you know, on the way through or on the way back some, from, from somewhere. And uh, what I like about this church is that there is genuine life. What I mean by that is, even after a song like you just heard, there's some amens and some shoutings, and that means that there's some life here. I've been to some churches, the same song could be sung, and like, is that all you can talk about is being justified? Give me more. Something's wrong with us if we can't get excited about our salvation. Am I right? Now you have to bear with me. I, I'm a little more comfortable being around teenagers and young people, and I really have a heart for the bus ministry, and I know this church does as well. Because about 46 years ago, that's how it started for the Ramos family, when somebody came by and invited my sister, who's a little bit older than me, and said, hey, can that girl ride a Sunday school bus? My mom said something to the effect, well, she can't go unless I go with her. And amazingly, they let my mom ride the Sunday school bus, and a couple weeks later, she trusted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. She's been teaching first grade Sunday school at our church for 42 years now. Now, my dad wasn't quite on board with the whole church thing. He worked at U.S. Steel Mill in Gary, Indiana. And uh, he's like, you guys can go. You do your thing. But I'm just going to stay put. Now, he, saw, he had enough wisdom to send us to the Christian school as an unsaved man. He had enough wisdom to tithe as an unsaved man. And I can go down the list. He had some wonderful things that God helped us through, through a man that was lost. But uh, when I was 18 years old, 17, 18 years old, somebody led him to Christ. And guess what he does now as a 74-year-old man? He drives a Sunday school bus every Sunday morning. So we believe in the bus ministry just like your church, and I would not be standing here without, number one, the Lord, but number two, a bus picking up our family for Sunday school. So keep up the good work. I want to commend you for what's going on. Keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. You don't know what you have here. I'm sure you've heard that before, but I bounce around to a lot of places, and they're content with maybe one or two people getting saved a year, one or two people getting baptized, it sounds like that happens every Sunday. Amen. We can get a little excited about that. Amen. Now, I'm nervous. Okay, I'm not, I'm not used to this big of a crowd. And I told Pastor Howell, just, just bear with me. It takes me a while to get off the runway. But he gave me a time limit, so I'm going to be done on time. But uh, I'm just honored to be here. And I want to be a blessing. I'll say this, you young people, you're doing a good job with them. Because when I come to chapel, they at least act like they like me. I don't know if they really do. They kind of fake like they do, so you trained them well at least there. But uh, that's a blessing. It's good to see Miss Robinson still at it. I taught her a long time ago. That's why she has all the problems she has. <laughs> but it's good to see her being faithful. And Brother and Mrs. Robinson, just a blessing to see you. I know he loves the bus ministry. Uh, that's, that's a blessing. So just for, for you that don't know us, we're, we're just, we're in our, my wife and I are in our 20th year of serving the Lord. We just try to do whatever pastor needs. We just plug in. And let me encourage you, if there's a need, and I think there are several around here, just jump in and say, sign me up. And you know what? You might be tired at the end of a Sunday, but it's a good tired. It's a good tired. So just we've been spoiled this whole the last couple of days. My kids just enjoy coming through. And that's probably why you see us so often, because we're spoiled. It's like, I need more. <laughs> Not really, but it is a blessing. Pastor's just been gracious. I know he prays for me and my family. Pastor Danny, I don't think he's in here, but he's shot text my way saying he's praying for us. It's been good to get to know Pastor Cowling a little bit. Last time I was here, he helped me a little bit on the bus ministry, which you've done there. Took us out to dinner last night. We had a, a, a great time with that. Got to coach a little wrestling practice. That was a lot of fun. And uh, I coach wrestling, so it was good to just plug in with the boys a little bit yesterday. And uh, so that's a little bit of us. Let's get to the Word of God. That's why we're here tonight, right? If you hear from me, it's a waste of your time. Let's hear from God. And we're going to look at the book of Ephesians. Now, I'll be honest with you. Tonight, I have a, a topic that your pastor might have to clean up after I leave. Don't get nervous. <laughs> but it's one of those topics that demands a proper balance. And me not being a pastor, I'd like to come in and kind of share it, but really, ultimately, it's up to your pastor, so I'm going to trust that you'll submit and follow your pastor's guidance in this particular area. But I want to talk tonight about biblical kindness. Now, let me just preface it by saying this. Biblical kindness is a little bit confusing to people. Because what happens is they feel like, you know, somebody 
kicks God in the teeth, if I can say it that way. They've been giving so much, they've been handed so much, they've gone to a Christian school, they've been a part of a good church, and then they go out and live for the devil, and they come back and they expect everybody to kiss them behind the ear. That's not what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about re receiving people that are repentant. Because when people come in and they're flaunting their sin, you know what it does? It puts the past in a bind because if he doesn't um, stand firm, then what the other young people are going to say, you know what, I can live this way and it's all okay. So this is a very delicate balance. I want to just kind of lay a little bit of surface here because every situation can be different. But I think if we look at things in a biblical perspective, it will help us. And so I'd, I'd like to just preface it by saying that because it is a touchy issue, if I can say it that way. So I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to help me. Would you pray for me tonight and just say, Lord, just give him wisdom so I say what I should and not say what I should not. Would you do that for me tonight? Let's pray. God, I'm so thankful I have your word as the absolute source of truth. If I give my opinion, the problem is it changes from week to week or month to month, but your word never changes. And I thank you that we can go to this particular topic tonight and we can find out exactly what you have to say and it can give us a foundation for the decisions that we make in our homes, in our ministries, and in our church. So would you just help me to be clear and concise in what you'd have me to say in the time that we have? And Lord, you know my heart. I just want to be a blessing. I've been just showered with blessings in the last couple of days, and each time me and my family or who's been with me, we've just been blessed, and I'd like to just share a little blessing if I could. So would you use your word to, to help tonight? I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple weeks ago, uh, we took our high school wrestling team to a public school over in Rockford, Illinois, Rockford Lutheran High School. And I was reminded of that. It was the 31st of January, and I, one of the mats was rolled out in the corner of the mat. It said, in loving memory of, and it had the name of a young person, Peyton Perot, and it had the date of his death. A couple years ago, one of our young men wrestled Peyton Perot, and after the wrestling match that was in, in January or February of that year, I got, an, I got an email, an article about Peyton Perot, who was a junior or senior in high school at the time, and he committed suicide. Now sometimes I scratch my head, especially as I work with young people, and it bothers me that a 16 or a 17 or 18 year old can just take their life. When that happens, it causes me to just scratch my head and say, what was going on in their life that was so overwhelming that it caused them, and maybe in one case, to take a gun and blow their brains out or to slit their wrist? And that bothers me with a young person who has, in a sense, their whole life before, before them. Uh, I have a small Bible club at, Ch club at Chesterton High School just seven or eight minutes from my home, and last year at Chesterton High School, four young people took their lives. And I often think, is there something going on in their home or something going on in their school that causes them to say, I can't take this anymore, and it causes them to end their lives. You know, we live in a violent world. I don't play video games. My sons really don't play a whole lot of video games, but when I'm in homes visiting, I'll watch kids playing video games. You know, a lot of the video games are shooting and killing and blood flowing and so forth. And, you know, you hear just about every day, murder here and this and that. But, you know, I, I find it interesting as you study this topic, the reason why our world is violent is because they're just stepping in line with their father. The Bible says in John 8 44, the devil is a liar and he's also a, help me out, he's a murderer. So, therefore, with abortion, they're just falling in line because it's okay to murder because that's what our father does. I like sporting events. I've gone to one hockey game about 20 years ago, and I remember going to the hockey game thinking, I'm going to watch hockey. Well, I was watching the Chicago Blackhawks versus the St. Louis Blues, and I believe in the course of three periods, 60 minutes, there were seven fights. And I found that when the fighting took place, the crowd got more and more excited. They yelled and screamed because the fight was taking place instead of the actual hockey game. Now, what's happened is this has progressed. Now you go to a basketball game, you go to baseball games, and what brings the crowd to life? A high inside tight pitch where the batter falls down and he gets up and he just, he glares at the pitcher and the crowd's like, get him, get him.
get them, sick them. Take your baseball bat out and beat the snot out of them. Now you read the Bible and you'll find that those that were possessed with devils were just filled with violence. The maniac of Gadara, what was he was doing? What was he doing? He was taking stones and he was cutting himself. Does that sound familiar nowadays? Because we have cutting going on. So when people are possessed with the devil, stay with me, they're going to live violently. They're going to live, here's the topic, they're going to live unkind. Now watch me close. When we are filled with God, I'm careful how I say this, when we are possessed with the Spirit of God, guess how we'll live? We'll be live with, live with love, joy, peace, long-suffering. It's completely opposite of the way the world lives. But here's my problem. Here's the situation I'm dealing with. In our Christian homes, there's a lot of unkindness. In our marriages, there's a lot of unkindness. And what happens is when the homes have a lot of unkindness, they bring it to the church house. Ah! And what I find is there's a lot of churches. Now, I'm sure that's never happened at Bridge, First Baptist Church in Bridgeport, but I will say it goes on at Fairhaven Baptist Church. I've been there for 43 years. I know it goes on in the Ramus household because I had a brother and sister, and we could duke it out. They were doozies. Now I got four kids, and they're really good at it. And what I found is this. If I let it go as a parent and don't deal with it as children, they're going to grow up and be teenagers that are duking it out, singles that are duking it out, married folks that are duking it out, and they live in, they have a church that's just duking it out. And I don't think it ought to be that way. I believe the church house ought to be a place of kindness, but can I go a step further? The kindness should continue on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Now, I'm almost off the runway. Now, much of my ministry deals with travel and being in other churches. And the last 20 years, I've been in hundreds of churches. It's interesting. Now, my kids, my, my boys are kind of almost out of this stage. My girls are 11 and 8, and they're still kind of in this stage where we go to a church, and they give us this real nice basket of goodies and so forth. And then we go back the next year. You know what they're doing? We remember the basket. Where is the basket? And it's like this treasure hunt the next year. And it's interesting. I tell them, hey, guys, I want you to do two or three jobs. And in 10 minutes, they forget. But they can remember what a church did for them a year ago. You with me? Now, we have a pretty large fundraiser at our church, at our Christian school. We're getting ready to start it in just a couple weeks. And we sell some $400,000 worth of candy in 12 days. It's a big ordeal, you can probably tell. Now, we take our kids, I think Gideon's going to Cle Cleveland this year, he's going to Cleveland, Columbus, Ohio, he's gone to St. Louis, I'm not sure where he's going. We take our kids everywhere to sell candy. And they will go all, all over the map, and it's interesting, we'll be driving through this, uh, this particular territory, they'll be driving down the road and say, oh, I remember that place, that place did this for me. And they'll drive down a little further, that, you know why they remember that? Because somebody in that store was kind. Let's look at our text because I think we can find this idea of biblical kindness and if we can apply it to ourselves and to our homes, I think it'd be a blessing to us. Now, help me out. I've got 25 minutes. I have five points. Okay, one of the points has one line only. All right, so look, we're just going to roll. All right, just stay with me. Fake like you're enjoying it. Smile once in a while. Throw an amen. It makes me feel good. Yeah. There we go. All right, very good. I got one. We're doing all right. Chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. It says this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Those are all inward sins that produce outward actions. Paul is sitting in a prison house for the cause of Christ. 
And while he's sitting there for the cause of Christ, he has enough in him because he's filled with the Spirit of God to tell people in this situation, you can still be kind. He says, you've got to put away bitterness. Friday of last week, I sat across the table from one of the most bitter men that I've ever talked to. He's one of my uncles. And he just spewed out bitterness and spewed out bitterness and spewed out bitterness. And by the time I left, I was unhappy. I felt miserable. But I'm so glad I could say this. Praise the Lord that God's allowed me to keep bitterness out of my life. It's not worth being there because it just makes you a miserable person. And Paul says, put it away. Get rid of it. But he continues the sentence in verse number 32. If you know it, you can quote it along with me. If not, why don't you read it with me? Verse number 32 says this. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now, do you remember two young men in the Bible by the name of Ishmael and Isaac? The reason for the departure of Hagar leaving was because Ishmael and Isaac were in contention, if you study the Bible. Children in the home. Now, parents, I was hoping the little ones would be in here to kind of get to them a little bit. But parents, we have to watch that. We have to guard against this because that's not Christian. I don't believe God will have our children and us being okay with tension and friction in the home. It ought not to be. So let's give you a couple things. Number one, we're going to look at verse 32. All points are going to come from verse number 32. So number one, the demand. Here it is in our text. The demand is to be kind. It's pretty simple. Here's the definition of kindness. We throw it out there. Everybody's going to have some form of a definition, but the dictionary says this. Kind, to be kind is to be disposed to do good to others and to make them happy by granting their requests. Now the teenagers are like, yes! I love that definition because mom and dad's job is to make me happy. Well, that's what kindness means. So my job as a Christian is to go around to folks in this church and to try to make them happy. It's not really that hard. And that's a demand. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. Paul says, be kind. Put away all these other things. And the demand is to simply be kind. Another definition is goodwill. Now, some of the ladies are like, I go there all the time. That's not what I'm talking about. But the ultimate act of kindness was when the angels came and said, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Now, let me stop here for a minute. I've found that it is natural to be kind that are kind to you. We come here, it's fun to have arguments because he tries to do stuff for me. I'm like, you know, just save it. But I've found that when somebody is kind to you, it is natural to be kind back to them. But here's the part that I think we need to understand. It is supernatural to be kind to those that are not kind to you. So that means when you go door knocking, my name is Eric, this is Gideon, we're from First Baptist Church of Bridgeport, and they do what they did to Madison tonight, they just knock her upside the head, blood's flowing, you're like, all I did was come to tell them about Jesus, and you want to take the door that they just slammed in your face and rip it off the wall and throw it in their front yard, and say, I'll slam the door again. Now hopefully you don't do that here because you're like, we do that, no, please don't do that. But it's easy to be kind and natural to be kind to those that are kind to you. But that's not the type of kindness we're talking about. Look at what it says, and I'll just read this verse. Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Listen to this. Jesus says, But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be called the children of the highest. Now listen to this. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. That, my friends, is God. That is a godly type of kindness. Again, it's natural to love them that love you, but it's supernatural to love them that don't love you. And the demand doesn't say be kind to those that are kind to you. It just simply says be kind. That's the demand. Number two, the direction in our kindness. It's pretty simple. Look down and see the next three words. Be ye kind. Help me out. That's your cue. One to another. So it looks like there's a whole bunch of people in here that have a big job. 
That's when the Christian life gets fun. Is how can I make you happy? Now you go to some churches and you sit in the pew and all of a sudden you just feel these eyes upon you. You're sitting there and you're all, you're getting comfortable. You're a visible visitor. And all of a sudden someone's just standing there. Hello? That's my pew. Okay, I'm really sorry. Did not, I was going to the lake of fire for taking your pew. But some people get upset over the most absurd things. And people just pack up and go on to the next church. They'll throw out all the good doctrine. They'll throw out all the good friendships. They'll throw away a Christian school. They'll throw away, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I've been around this long enough. And you sit back and you say, what in the world is wrong with them? They just feel like they were done wrong. Our responsibility is to go around based on this, is to just look around. Here's Pastor, Pastor Culling down there. How can I be kind to him? And what happens is, is you start to think and you start to dwell. You get out of your own little bitter pity party, out of sympathy swamp, and you'll start loving to give and loving to help people because all of us have needs. And when you just bring a smile to somebody's face, isn't that pretty happy? The ultimate act of kindness is giving the gospel when you can see a changed life. So the demand, help me out, what's the demand? I got two people that remember. The, the demand is to, the direction is, here we go, number three, the depth. Now when I read this word, it almost makes me feel feminine. I'm not a feminine individual. I like manliness. I tell boys, if God created you a man, walk like a man. Yeah. You ladies, if he created you, walk like It's not hard to figure out. Our world is struggling with this. But Christians ought not to struggle with this. So when I see feminine people, I get a little nervous. You stay over there, I'll stay over here. All is well. But here's a word that is almost comes across to me as feminine. The word is tender hearted. Now this is a Bible word. So here's what the word means. It says this, the definition, having great sensibility. So what it seems to indicate is this tender hearted comes from down deep and there's some senses that get involved. For instance, if I touch a hot stove, my senses tell me that's hot, something's bound to happen. I hit that stove, it's ah! Something takes place. You're looking at me like, that's never happened. It happens to me. I think what this indicates is this. If my son comes up and he's going to sing a special, and he walks up the stairs here and he gets to about the third stair from the top and he trips and hits the deck. He just falls flat on his face. His nose starts bleeding. I kind of have a hunch what the, these second... Two, rows two, three, and four are going to do. They're already doing it. <laughs> what a loser. He can't even walk up the steps. And I probably would join them. Because my senses, naturally, my carnal senses, will say laugh at him. But someone that's tender-hearted, there's a sense that's a little bit different. When somebody hits the deck and they're, fall, they're bleeding, they're going to be quick to run and help that person because there's something down deep that's tender-hearted. This is anti-teenage boy, just so you know. But I think the Bible's clear here because this is where, like I said, when I hear the word tender-hearted, it's like, hey guys. That's kind of what I ha gather. I don't do that, sorry, that was just... Where the senses should be if... A young man sees a lady struggling with something, the natural reaction should be run there and say, how can I help? Sure. When a, here it is. And I've struggled with this. This is what the Lord's dealing with my heart about right now. You know, I found it's really easy when a young person falls away to write them off. Guilty. I hang my head in shame because it's easy to just kick them on the curb. They sinned. What is wrong with those people? But if I stop and consider the Lord Jesus Christ, 
the tenderheartedness of my Savior. His senses said, though they were yet sinners, I'm still going to die for them. They're going to fail me tomorrow. He knows what's coming, yet he still looks ahead and says, I'm still going to love them. I'm still going to forgive them. I'm still going to show mercy. I'm still going to be full of compassion. That's my Savior. So the depth of kindness comes from the heart. Can I give you the fourth thing quickly? The duty in our kindness. What's the next phrase? Forgiving one another. This uncle of mine that sat across from the table, he was just saying, they won't forgive him and they won't forgive him and they won't forgive him and they won't forgive him. And I'm sitting there thinking, hmm, sounds like a common theme. You're not doing the same thing. And the Lord gave me liberty to tell him that. The duty is forgiveness. Now, if you read the prayer that the Lord gives us as our model prayer, he says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. So it may be that our forgiveness is directly proportional to the forgiveness that God gives to us. That's a thought. And I'm so glad I can say that as John writes, if we confess our sins, help me out, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How terrible a father would I be if one of my, one of my daughters, my eight-year-old Karis, man, she got the cutest chocolate chip eyes, but when she disobeys and she does something wrong and she comes to me and I say, Karis, now bend over and I give her a whooping and she comes and she got tears flowing down her face. She says, Daddy, would you forgive me? Woman, don't ever, ever do that to me again. What's wrong with you? Sit down and be quiet. You'd say, what is wrong with that individual? And you'd be exactly right. But sometimes we do that in the church house. I'm not saying we, I, I, I'm just pointing at me. Sometimes I do that in the church house. I expect this guy right here, if I come and say, hey, brother, would you just forgive me? You better say yes right now. I'm going to knock the snot out of you. <laughs> but why is it when he comes to me, it's almost like, now your voice inflection did not clearly show how, now, did you really mean it? And we kind of give him this go around. Now, I got a little ahead of myself. But our duty is to forgive, but the director is last. What does it say at the end of the verse? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now, I was watching Brother McCurdy lead songs. Whatever they do. I'm not good at song leading. But let's just say she's playing the piano and she just doesn't feel like following the director. She wants to do her own thing. And he leads the song, and you're like, you know what, that's way too slow. I'm going faster. And actually, I don't even like the song he picked. I want to sing How Great Thou Art instead. And so everybody just does their thing. Now watch me close. What happens to the song service? Chaos. And when you're leading the orchestra and it's about the time for the strings to come in and you go do this towards the strings and the tuba just feels like it's his time to go. So it's supposed to be wah, and all of a sudden you're wah. It just messes things up. It's called discords. Hmm. So this is what ought to happen. When you have that rift with a brother or sister, it's almost as if God, as the director, does this. And on cue, you ought to forgive. And when you don't, there's a whole lot of discord among the brethren. Now, I feel like maybe the Lord would have me preach this, and I'll tell you why. Because right now, what's going on here just from talking to Pastor Cowling and to Pastor Ryan about this youth thing coming up this Saturday and talking about some of the things that are going on in the bus ministry, I'm not even a member here, and I'm excited. But you know how all that goes downhill? When you don't follow the director. Because I got a hunch somebody's going to annoy somebody tonight. I hear that somebody was already with me. Your kid is going to annoy you tonight. He said I already did. 
Now, parents, I think it would be a good thing for us on occasion to ask our kids forgiveness if needed. It's not unmanly. It's actually Christian. And so we see the director. Can you just picture for a moment our Lord as He hangs on the cross? He has seven cries from the cross, does He not? But the one that gets me the most is when He says, Father... And I can't forgive my wife for something silly. I can't forgive my children when they blow it. Guilty. Guilty. And I think so often our homes are filled with discord because of a lack of kindness. Now, I'm going to close with an illustration, and I actually stole it from Dr. Roulette some years ago, so you've probably heard this before. But would you bear with me? I mess up illustrations, so I read them. (laughs) Because I want you to get the whole thrust of it. But could you bear with me just for a moment as I read this illustration? One day, when I was a freshman in high school, I saw a kid from my class walking home from school. His name was Kyle. Kyle. It looked like he was carrying all of his books. I thought to myself, why would anyone bring home all his books on a Friday? He must really be a nerd. I had quite a weekend planned, parties, football games, and so forth, so I just shrugged my shoulders and bypassed him. As I was walking, I saw a bunch of kids running toward him. They ran at him, knocking all his books out of his arms and tripping him so he landed in the dirt. His glasses went flying. I saw him land in the grass about 10 feet from him. He looked up, and I saw this terrible sadness in his eyes. My heart went out to him, so I jogged over to him and he crawled around looking for his glasses, and I saw a little bit of tears in his eyes. I went and handed, got his glasses and handed him his glasses and said, those guys are real jerks. They really should get a life. He looked at me and said, hey, thanks. Now there was a big smile on his face. It was one of those smiles that showed real gratitude. I helped him pick up his books and asked him where he lived. As it turned out, he lived near me, so I asked him why I'd never seen him before. He said he had gone to a private school before now. I would never have hung out with a private school kid, but we talked all the way home, and he actually came, uh, came out to be a pretty nice, turned out to be a pretty nice kid. I asked him if he wanted to hang out with us on the weekend, and he did. And the more I got to know Kyle, the more I liked him, and my friends thought the same of him. Monday morning came, and there was Kyle with a huge stack of books again. I stopped and said, man, you're going to build some serious muscles carrying those books. He just laughed and handed me half the books, and we continued on our way to school. Over the next couple of years, Kyle and I became best friends. When we were seniors, we began to think about college. Kyle decided on Georgetown and I was going to Duke. I knew that we would always be friends, that the miles would never be a problem. He was going to be a doctor and I was going for business on a football scholarship. Kyle was valedictorian of our class. I teased him all the time about being a nerd. He had to prepare a speech for graduation. I was glad it wasn't me. Graduation day came, I saw Kyle. He looked great. He was one of those guys that really found himself during high school. He filled out and actually looked good in glasses. He had more dates than me, and all the girls really liked him. Sometimes I was jealous. Today was one of those days. I could see that he was nervous about his speech, so I just smacked him on the back and said, Hey, big guy, you're going to be great. He looked at me with one of those looks, the really grateful ones, and smiled and said, Thanks. But as he started his speech, he cleared his throat and began saying, graduation is a time to thank those who helped you make it through those tough years, parents, teachers, siblings, maybe a coach, but mostly your friends. He said, I'm here to tell you, all of you, that being a friend to someone is the best gift you can give them. I'm going to tell you a story. He writes, I just looked at my friend with disbelief as he told the story of the first day we met. He had planned to kill himself over the weekend. He talked of how he had cleaned out his locker so his mom wouldn't have to do it later and was carrying all of his books and his items home. He looked hard at me and gave me a little smile. He said, thankfully, I was saved. My friend saved me from doing the unspeakable. I heard the gasp go through the crowd as this handsome, popular boy told us all about his weakest moment. I saw his mom and dad looking at me and smiling that same grateful smile. Not until that moment did I realize its depth Never underestimate the power of your actions. Now let me just close and bring it closer to home, to your church, to your family. You have no idea what he's going through tonight. I have no idea. I have no idea what she's going through tonight. And it could be just a simple act of a young man going, picking up glasses, kind of patting the guy on the back and saying, let's go could bring him life again. 
You go to the bus homes, don't you? You know what's there. We've got some kids that just started coming to our school this year. My wife picks them up sometimes in the mornings, and as the kids are going out the door, they are getting absolutely cussed out. There might be girls that walk in the doors on Saturday for the youth rally or on Sunday for the, for the service. They might have gotten raped this week. Excuse me. You have no idea. Uh, today we, had a, we went to a restaurant and the service was not good. But I tipped the girl more than we normally tip. Because maybe she had a bad day today. You follow? You follow? This is biblical kindness because you remember when people do kind things to you, don't you? I sure do. But you'll also remember the unkind acts that are done to you. My challenge is let our homes be places of kindness. Let our Sunday school classes, our junior church classes, the bus routes, when those kids come in, they should be greeted by members here. I'm sure it happens. I'm sure it happens. But I tell you what, maybe you're one that's kind of reclusive. It may be you just have to grab one of those kids. They may not know a mom. They may not know a dad. I've got 13 boys that I meet with on Sundays. I asked them a couple Sundays ago, how many of you guys, just curious, how many of you have a dad? One raised his hand. One. And you know what it told me? I can be a dad to this kid. At least while he's at church. And just show them a little bit of love and a little bit of kindness. Because that's just what the Bible teaches is to be ye kind. It's a demand one to another. That's the direction. Here's that word, tenderhearted, way down deep. Because sometimes you just don't want to be kind to people. I don't. And then forgiving one another. Because those people are probably going to do you wrong. But on cue, when God says, forgive. Yes, sir. And that's what keeps unity in this church. Maybe it's just a warning tonight, because I like what's going on here. It kind of makes me want to keep coming back and say, what am I missing out on? I'm kind of excited about this youth rally, and I sure wish I would have known about it. I'm upset, but I'll forgive you this time. Are you with me? We get uptight about the craziest things. He did me wrong. She did me wrong. But I think we can practice biblical kindness. Is this helpful? Is this making sense? It's biblical kindness. Now sometimes we have different situations. I'm going to dump that on him. That's his job. But I do believe and I'm, I've failed in this area too many times. A kid in our youth group, a kid in our college is wrong and you're just ready to kick them on the curb. You know what they need sometimes? They've stumbled. I'm like, <laughs> Pastors stumble and we <laughs> something's wrong with us folks. When we stumble, I'm so glad that God's there to pick me up Amen. and revive my life. Why can't I do the same? Hopefully we can just chew on this a little bit tonight. Let's bow together. Lord, I, I hope this was helpful. I, I am not the one to get up and be the example of kindness, but I know you've worked on my heart in this area. I've been unkind to my own kids. I've been unkind to my wife. I've been unkind to fellow church members. And it's shameful. But Lord, I pray that we could just take something maybe that you've dealt with our hearts tonight or just point it out. Maybe there's someone here tonight that across the aisle there's somebody that they haven't forgiven. I believe this hurts so many churches. There's a lack of forgiveness. And I pray that maybe this could get cleared up tonight and you wouldn't be hindered even on Saturday with the youth conference. So would you just work in hearts tonight, I ask. Pastor.